Welcome to Silicon Valley Leaders Symposium. Uh, Mr. Malani has been with Oracle for the past 16 years, since 1994. During this period, he has held various management engineering positions, which include product management for Oracle customer services and development and delivery of Oracle products across multiple platforms. Prior to Oracle, Mr. Malani led product developments for Cross Access, which is now the IBM DB2 Data Joiner Classic Connect product. Now, please join me in welcoming Mr. Mark Milani, Senior Vice President of Oracle Corporation. All right. Okay, thank you very much. That was great. Uh, that was a great introduction. Uh, this is uh, kind of coming home for me. I um, uh, probably 1982 was the last time I was here when I was vigorously pursuing my undeclared major <laughs> at San Jose State. Um, I uh, spent two years at San Jose State uh, for various reasons, long stories. Went up to San Francisco State, pursued a computer science degree there, graduated from there. Um, subsequently, went into a graduate program. Uh, after working at IBM, decided, you know, it's time to get a job. So didn't quite do that, but this is a homecoming. My family graduated from here. It's a real pleasure. and and thank you for having me. Um, just to provide a little bit more background, it'll be a little bit more context for later in the presentation. As, as, uh, as was mentioned, I've been at Oracle since 1994, started at IBM, uh, went to a couple of smallish companies, um, eventually came to Oracle. Throughout all of that time, I've been working across the software spectrum, primarily in a systems integration role or a solutions role, and to put it more simply, basically bringing a lot of parts together to represent one. Um, whether it's multiple operating systems, whether it's different storage networks, different networks, my whole career has been about either moving software to that environment or bringing it together to deliver some sort of uh, consolidated value, if you will. So um, I started, uh, uh, Oracle Service Engineering in 2002 was really an outgrowth of something. I have Tom Hildebrand here from, from Oracle. It's something him and I collaborated on. We were engineering a part of Oracle's engineering, we were uh, part of their process of developing software and moving it to other platforms. In doing that, we optimized it so well that we created an opportunity to create this other group called Service Engineering. And what that is, is it's basically engineering um, it, it's basically taking the services business, which Oracle was just starting, and starting to provide engineered services to it. In particular, and this is germane to the rest of the, the presentation, is um, it was starting a hosting company. And what a hosting company is, is we basically take Oracle software, we put it, and we run it on behalf of the customer. But the initial stab at that was we take the software and we put it on whatever machine, and it was incredibly difficult to maintain. So they... Oracle took a step back, rethought how to, how to do that, asked myself and some others to get more involved in it so that we can engineer it and make it standard, repeatable, and you're going to start hearing cloud themes. Um, being able to uh, take uh, standard software images, patch models, all these things, and be able to replicate it over, over customers. It was a complete shift from where we were before, and they realized that you couldn't do that through just having a bunch of smart people working on the machines. You needed to actually engineer it into the architecture, and that was my charter. And that started in 2002. Since then, has become kind of the backbone of our Oracle On Demand service, um, which at some point will have some cloud name in it, which is, uh, I, would, I would maintain, at least in the short term, uh, and I've heard you've had other presentations on the cloud, you'll see a lot of people renaming their services to cloud. We'll go through that in a little bit. Um, since then, I've also worked on uh, support services, advanced customer services, which is an advanced service, but all of it had the same theme. Let's go standardize the technology footprint underneath the service offering, right, so that we can scale it out, so that we can repeat it, we can operate it at, at, uh, at an effective cost. Um, all of it's built around a cost util utilizing Oracle software. Um, I'll talk about commodity platforms later, but all of it's built on commodity platforms, meaning Intel-based x86 platforms. 
again, I was working on the system side, so I had quite a bit of experience, which is another reason I got dragged into what is now becoming cloud services. So, how many of you have heard of cloud computing or the computing cloud? Yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, really taken off over the past year or two. Um, it's, uh, if you look behind me here, they, it's number two on uh, Gartner's CIO survey in terms of pri technology priorities for CIOs. Well, the interesting thing about this, when I talk to CIOs and I ask them, what are you doing with cloud? And ask them, what is cloud? I get as many answers as there are CIOs I ask the question of. And in fact, I think you've had a couple of presentations already. You'll probably see yet another variant of the cloud with me from what you've seen. There'll probably be some common themes. But what's happening right now is this is, a, this is something that happens in technology today, is these things take off. There's a desire from the CIO, the, the customer in our case. The supplier wants to satisfy the customer. There's some sort of technology thing going underneath that causes this. And how do we reconcile this? And so what happens is everyone rushes to it. And the title of my, my uh, presentation was, what problem are you trying to solve? And many times people forget which problem they're trying to solve. We're not building a cloud to have a cloud. We're building a cloud to do something. Now, each business has to go through some process of taking this kind of momentum, this hype, breaking it down, and then reconstructing it for a business. And what the intent of this presentation is kind of walk you through that. Number one, look at how at least we in Oracle On Demand have looked at the cloud. What is it? Number two, what are the technology enablers underneath it, right? And number three, I'm going to walk at the end, kind of a, a case study, if you will, on how we took the technology enablers and start constructing a solution. See, my biggest issue since I've been in engineering for the past 20 years is that engineers have an ability to solve the wrong problem really well. And that's obviously not the goal. And cloud is just the most recent incarnation of this. If you look below it, there's Web 2.0, so social, social websites and so on are all embodied by that. Same thing. I was asked when I was engineering support, why don't you build me a social website? To do what? Well, <laughs> look, it's number three. Right? Number three, we, we need to build one. Well, to do what? In the support business, it's about processing and solving problems. What are we trying to do? It's the number one thing. I can't tell you how many times at Oracle I sit and I watch really good engineering wasted because we don't really ask what is the problem we're trying to solve. Cloud's the most recent incarnation. As I walk through this, hopefully you can start considering some of the things I'm saying relative to new technologies or even technologies that have already passed us by in terms of how it was approached, how many failed attempts it was to achieve something with this technology because we didn't try to solve the right problem. So let's start with what is cloud computing. And I'm sure you've had definitions on this already. So let's start with Wikipedia. Wikipedia is becoming one of, my favorite, uh, one of my favorite places to find things out these days, speaking of social websites. It's internet-based. It has shared resources. I get the resources on demand like a public utility, OK? That's good. Public utility isn't new to me. I started at IBM. They had public utilities back in the late 60s. They are called leasings. It was one big box. That's a cloud. It was a shared resource. So what's new? Is there anything new here? So as a mainframe guy, this is a hard definition for me to consume. It's like I've always done this in computing. Okay? Salesforce.com. It's up the road a ways here. Right? Shared data center. We have that theme of sharing. Just log in, customize, and start using it. Salesforce, what do they do? They provide Salesforce automation application. They're an application provider. If you look at their cloud definition, it's really oriented towards what they do. You flip it on, you, you log into a, a browser, and all of a sudden their application appears, and you don't have to worry about anything in the back. It's all the cloud. I didn't see that in the Wikipedia definition. Let's move on to another provider, 
rack space, right? Pooled computing resources delivered over the web. But we're starting to see sharing, pooling, delivered over the web. They have an interest in, don't have to raise the capital. Don't have to pay for everything up front. Pay as you go. So they're starting to introduce some business terminology in here. Pay for it as you use it. That's convenient because they're an infrastructure provider. There's no definition around the application here. Oracle has its own, right? We all have our own. NISTE's trying to define it. I think they've done a heck of a job given all the definitions that are in the marketplace today. If you look at it, we have three service models. We have software as a service, what they call platform as a service, where you can do SOA-based services or database services. You have infrastructure as a service, which is data center, storage server, network at the bottom. Okay, that's pretty all-encompassing. Salesforce, probably Oracle could fit in here. Oracle On Demand can fit in here and here. CRM On Demand, which is an Oracle service, can fit here. Okay, so they're starting to cover, but that's the whole portfolio I already had long before the cloud. So is this definition really helpful? It's just defining what I already have, or is it recasting what I already have? Four deployment models. This is because as they start doing public cloud, so Amazon EC2 is what you would consider a public cloud, where developers can get on, get some computing resource, develop things. But there are inherent limitations, which we'll talk about later with that. So then you need a private cloud, the cloud behind the company's firewall that's not available to the public. Oracle has private clouds. Hybrid cloud, because we can't figure out which cloud we are, we have to have a name for that, right? It's a hybrid cloud. Community cloud, I still don't understand. I kind of understand the notion of it, but I don't really understand the value of it. But you can see what NISTI's doing here is they're trying to be all-encompassing in terms of the standard definition. This isn't helping me. I mean, I, I'm beginning to characterize it, but do I have this straight yet? I was doing something. It looks like it can fit in the definition, and now I've got all these new terms. If you go look at on there, all these new terms, I can't even explain a bunch of these. So what's happening is it's gained momentum. There's a high interest. There's a lot of people trying to characterize what's going on, but we still haven't defined what the problem is. In fact, the definitions are really being focused on the problem that a particular vendor is trying to solve. It's really not a notion around a cloud. It's about what Salesforce wants to do, Oracle wants to do, Amazon EC2, you know, Google Apps, etc. So, I typically get asked, hey, Mark, can you engineer a service? You know, we have a bunch of people doing things. The tickets go across queues. Can you automate it so it's all a flow and it's all nice and it's less expense, it's repeatable, it's predictable? That's what engineers do, right? That's what we do. Well, this case, it comes backwards. There's an engineered technology. Could you go build me a cloud? Okay, but as we just saw, I don't even know what the hell that is at this point, right? I'm sitting there looking at these definitions. I can't figure that out. You know, what problem are we trying to solve? What problem are we trying to solve here? So there's a whole bunch of models that deal with this kind of phenomenon that happens in technology where we're, uh, the interest takes this precipitous spike uh, there's a rush by CIOs to buy something. There's a rush by suppliers to satisfy their appetite on that. And to find that, Gardner has one which I find fairly simple to explain. There's other variants of this. There are all kinds of variants on the theme. Um, but Gardner calls it the hype curve. And whether it's me or other speakers here, people that are providing cloud services right now are really on this hype curve and trying to deal with it and trying to manage it. And the general principle of it is, at the, at the bottom, you have some sort of technology enabler that starts this whole thing. It didn't start out of nowhere. There are some technology enablers that are starting this, that are starting this uh, interest level, this level of investment, this level of coverage. So this is very important to understand. This is what's driving it. That's not solving a problem. That's a technology trigger. Then there's this precipitous climb up into what they call the peak of inflated expectations. And Gartner's most recent has cloud right at the tip of it. 
right next to flat screen 3D televisions. Right? I mean, I think what's happened is there's a lot of interest. I mean, you can look at that outside of, you know, enterprise software. Same kind of phenomenon. There is something happening. 3D television is now available. It's got some driver underneath here. Everybody wants everything from it, but there's no content behind it, for example. So your expectation is I want to watch things in 3D, if that's what you like doing. And you get to the top and you get to the peak of inflated expectations and it's like, well, there's no 3D content. I remember when I first got my 1080i TV, that was fabulous, but I had one or two programs on it. That's great. I just spent a bundle on this. I actually pre-bought and I didn't even know what problem I was solving because if I did, I probably wouldn't have bought it until they had more content. So what happens is we go from the peak and then they call this trough of disillusionment. And I can characterize a lot of my career working in here, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> because I've been really fortunate. I've been able to work on the cloud. I've been able to work on different kinds of internet, software as a service is how on demand, all the big words that in technology. But I've also continually dealt with this peak of inflated expectations. And so what happens is we start deploying, CIOs start buying, right? They start, uh, they start putting them into their business and things aren't quite going like what they want. I can share a story where we had a very large uh, client in Geneva. Uh, Larry Ellison visited him and sold him what Oracle called its single instance strategy where we moved all of our systems onto one instance and all the advantages of that. And he says, you know what? That's what I need to do. My company was built out of acquisitions. I had bought 400 companies. I am over 140 countries. I have that many accounting systems and I want one. I'm in. Well, think about that. Think about how hard that is. These systems through acquisition, so they weren't designed as one, so I'm putting on our engineering hats, right? None of them were designed together and now you're going to go all put them into a single, in this case, database. All the accounting practices are different. The accounting practices for different countries are different. The governance around how you manage the accounting is different. Everything's different. But boy, that single instance sounds great because this particular CEO wanted to slash costs pretty dramatically and this is one way he was going to do it. He also wanted to report more accurately and to manage his business more with more precision. These are all great, but it's all sitting at the peak. Now, I wasn't a part of any of that until <laughs> this started happening. And, you know, I, I guess I've developed a particular skill to manage it back up the other way, which is why I get called into these. And then you talk to them and you have to start going through this slope of enlightenment. The fact is, Oracle did provide technology that helped them, right? It's just that the expectations were so high, there is no possible way it could have delivered to them. It still was providing orders of magnitude benefit to that particular company if they even got part of the way there. So that's where we start working and we start up this slope of enlightenment and this customer, in this case, is a single instance strategy. We get over the hump. They start taking advantage. Massive, massive cost savings. Even though we never really met this, because we could never have met that. We were able to, he was able to return. He's now a CEO of a very, very large company. I don't want to get into who it was, but he had so much success there, he's become a company that we're all familiar with in the auto industry now. That's the CEO. He, it's, it's quite extraordinary. He turned that company from a loss to enormous profits. He's a turnaround artist. But he, we had to manage him through this. I think we're going to do the same, we're having to do the same thing with cloud. And I'll break it down a little bit more because as a service provider and providing engineering, I want to make sure that I don't try to solve that problem that can't be solved. Otherwise, I'm guaranteed failure. However, I do believe there's something happening here that would solve a very important problem. Okay? So this is the hype curve. There's other models of this. They have different terms for it and different kinds of waves and so on. And some people are more sophisticated, but this is simple enough. Gardner actually has this produced. If you want to go see what technologies are sitting on in where, and you can, uh, they base, I think that's public. They put that on their public website. You'll see cloud at the top. Okay. 
So let's get into the specifics of cloud. So now that I kind of understand the landscape, I've got this general notion of, a, of there's a lot of hype in the system. I still don't have a problem defined, but I'm still asked to build a cloud. Like a good engineer, my choice is, well, let's just go build one. And I can succeed only if I choose the right path and solve the right problem or create the right opportunity. So remember at the bottom of it, we had technology triggers. This isn't a comprehensive list. This is, this is Mark Milani's list. I'd say people would agree with two out of three, and then I'll explain why people might, have, might debate me on the third. So the first one is uh, scalable commodity infrastructure. I just put up the most recent Oracle announcement as a, just for a visual here, but I'm not going to talk about Exologic so much as what, it, what does it mean scalable commodity infrastructure? Well, one of the reasons I got involved in on-demand was because way back before Linux was popular and widely deployed, we already, Tom and I, were already porting to Linux. We were already taking Oracle software and putting on Linux. We were like one of the few putting mission critical enterprise on Linux, which runs on Intel, commodity infrastructure. And we developed quite a bit of expertise on how to deal with that. Just a slight digression, I was the mainframe guy at Oracle. I was all about big boxes, lots of capacity, mission critical, banks, you know, telcos. That's what I was about. And then all of a sudden, I'm the Linux guy. How did I make that transition? You know, like a good mainframe guy, I just said all this stuff was garbage. You know, you want a real box, you go to the mainframe. <laughs> it was really hard for me to do this. But a light bulb went off with me on this, what, what it can do. We were running our applications on these big boxes. They were running well. We were looking at them, but uh, we wanted more capacity. We had a really hard time getting that big box to provide more capacity. And we'd reached the edge of the box. So we started putting Linux boxes in front of it, Intel boxes, commodity infrastructure. Once, you st once we started doing that, we started seeing amazing performance. Those processors in those boxes were significantly faster. Because the, s the infrastructure itself was so so much cheaper, we can oversize them so we never hit any of the weaknesses. So particularly at that time, those boxes, when they start uh, contending for resources, like it needs something and it can't get it, they don't handle it well. That's, that's in a nut. In a nut that's netting out exactly what, what the problem was. But who cares? So my mainframe thinking, where you have to optimize everything, you've got to make sure everything's balanced right, and when you hit capacity, you start paging out and you start doing a lot of complicated things. Mainframes are the best in the world at doing that. I had to completely redo that thinking when I started understanding the opportunity here. This is a true technology trigger. What happened is we oversized the boxes. We paid about one one hundredth of the cost with a bigger footprint, and we got faster performance. And because we never hit the limits on the box, because we oversized them and it never had to do all that really complicated stuff the mainframe did, it worked. Of course, all the computer scientists were completely uh, against, you know, the computer scientists at Oracle is working on big boxes. You must be crazy. That box doesn't work. That's a toy operating system. I'm sorry. The problem we were solving was to go faster, to be able to scale, and that's what it does. Who cares that it doesn't handle it? Who cares? We never hit it. So this was a really big eye-opener, and today this is what's happening in computing. The infrastructures continue to scale, the processors continue to get fast, the prices, the prices continue to drop. Memory, uh, or, uh, memory and uh, server prices are going way down. The technology to link these together continues to improve. I think a couple of years ago, a colleague of mine, Wim Koeckert, uh, was here. He has a Oracle Linux. Um, that is getting considerably better. It's getting more mission critical. It has enterprise capabilities. We're starting to put more and more capacity on the box. This is what happens with commodity infrastructures. At first, they seem that they're not working really well. Over time, they, they're working well enough. So this is the first thing. Second thing, virtualized access to computing. So virtualization, virtualizing computing resource is not a new concept, right? So uh, let me go back to the mainframe. In the mainframe, virtualization is the way you did everything. You had one box, and the mainframe virtualized it, and you can put workloads on it, and you can partition, you can do all these cool things on it. However, in the 
used to be more in the Unix space, but certainly in the Intel space there wasn't a lot of capability. Well, that's changing. I think you had a representative from VMware. They obviously are helping change it. Uh, I mentioned Wim. He's got our Oracle VM. So the virtualization of server resources is now logical. It's not physical. When I first started in on-demand, it was cheap hardware. Put it in a rack, rack it all up, right? And it would be all the processing. The only way you would scale is put another box in. Now I can do that through software. Give me this, put it here, make it bigger, make it smaller. There's no more physical part of it. We can create a pool and then allocate within, add more, take some out. So the capabilities that are, that are being built right now are becoming extremely re robust in this place on the x86. And now, now I don't only get the speed, I don't only get the low cost, but now I'm starting to get the capability I had on the mainframe. Uh, network, networks continues to be, the abstraction level comes up. So actually this is left out by uh, a lot of Oracle people. I, I'm not one of them that leaves the network out, but a lot of them do because what does Oracle do? It does data, uses servers, it uses storage, so those two are definitely in all the sides. The network and the virtualization of the network and the management of the network is really important. And what happens at Oracle is they defer to people and providers like me and our IT department and customers' IT departments to do the virtualization of the network so that I can make everything in the data center look like resource that can be moved around in a cloud, if you will. So network's a pretty important part. Storage, another area where there's virtualization. When I started in on-demand, we were doing block storage, which is very heavy in terms of its management, very difficult to do. We moved to network attached storage, and the abstraction layer moved up. Now we have software managing storage. It's not nearly as complicated. There were huge layers that would do a lot of things that we had to do manually. Now, what was the trade-off? Trade-off was when you went network attached, everyone says, oh, it's too slow, it's not the fastest storage, and, but I had the same response that we had on the servers. You know what, it's fast enough. Who cares that it's not as fast? I don't need it. I'd rather pay a heck of a lot less money be able to do this. You can start seeing a theme in, that's going on with w what I'm discussing here. Is everyone always says, well, it's not the fastest, so we shouldn't do it. Well, what problem are we trying to solve? If I figure out the right problem, then I choose the right model. It all comes with the right problem. I can't tell you how much resistance. I talked to a, a very large telco in, uh, in Australia, and he said, can you tell me how you re-engineered your entire environment? I go there, all I see is all the benchmarks, everything's fine. But everybody wants to buy the fastest storage, which costs 10 times as much. How did you do it? Well, you know what? It's because the problem wasn't well defined. Because they were making a storage problem. They already had storage. They had storage people that were experienced in this block storage and not this new storage. So you really do got to define the right problem. The second technology trigger for the cloud is this idea of virtualized access across the network storage and server system. Okay? So that's the technology, next technology trigger. Third one, and this is the one people might debate me on, but I guess I've been working in the service side too long. What's happening in IT today is that, so great, I can provision a server, I can pr provision computing, I can provision storage, I can provision network, but who cares? It's up, it's running. Up, oh, bug. Got to patch it. Oh, I have, I have a thousand of them. How do I do that? Cloud isn't going to work if you can't patch them. Because there are bugs that happen and you are going to have to patch them. How do I do it? I need a change management framework. So what's happening, IT is understanding this. I need a config man. I need to even know what's out there. I would argue what's happening in virtualization today is most people don't even know what the heck's out there anymore because it's so easy to create and bring them up and down. Remember, we're in a cloud. We're just sitting at a console and we're bringing them up and down. I don't even know where they are anymore. So let's just order more machines, I guess, because I don't know what I can take away or replace or downsize. So what's happened in IT, and certainly us in Oracle On Demand have figured this out, is that there's this service framework that's being developed in all IT shops. Now, different ones are doing it better than others where they abstract these things out. They realize that this cloud infrastructure that sits below it needs some sort of management framework on top of it. And so what they're starting to do you know, again, getting back to engineering, is creating modular blocks of things they do. What happens if they do that? They can repeat things. Okay, so these are all engineering themes. They can repeat them, make them more modular. They can string them together differently. 
So I think this is actually really, you know, so is kind of a form of this, right? For those that are familiar with that. You're starting to look at things from a service orientation, not that I need, a, I need compute, I need storage, I need network. You're starting to look at it as I need all those things, but then I need to manage them. And how do I manage them? And if it's all ad hoc, then what's the use of the cloud in the back? It's all manual, it's expensive now, and I just have more of it versus I have some sort of framework, some sort of idea of how to manage the thing, monitor it, fix it, diagnose it. So this is the third, third thing that's happening in IT today. I have no trouble talking to CIOs about an ITIL services framework. They go, we get it. That you're doing it on our behalf and you're putting it over a cloud, that's great. I don't have to explain that. ITIL's been around for a long time. It's only in the last probably three or four years that it's really gained traction in IT shops. Because what's happening is they're starting to create these clouds or grids, if you will, in the back, and they have no way to manage them. A large, uh, a large, very, very large customer with plenty of resources to do their own IT wanted to outsource to us, and I asked him why, and he says, because I have 3,000 Red Hat Linux instances, and to upgrade, I don't know how to do it. He didn't have it. So great, he's got a cloud. He's got a bunch of instances. He can provision them. He can... He can uh, he can bring them up, he can bring them down, he can monitor them, but now he needs to upgrade them. And he can't do it. He wanted to pay Oracle a lot of money just to do that. And Oracle's already built this ITIL framework services, at least we have, out of necessity, over a standard framework. So I think this is the third trigger. Some people might agree with me or not disagree, so this is kind of Mark's view of the cloud. But I think this is really important. Everyone's building this, whether they abstract it this way or not. They have to. And if they're not, then they're providing really primitive infrastructure that will only have so much utility to the customer. You know, I'd argue Amazon EC2 is starting to build pieces of this. Right now, you can just get an image, they provision it, and you do whatever the heck you want with it. But at some point, you're going to have to change it, upgrade it, move it, put it into a different environment, and I'll guarantee they're working on different artifacts of that. So those are the three technology triggers. Okay, so let's go back to the Gardner hype curve. We have the technology triggers. Right, so we have commodity, scalable commodity infrastructure, virtualized access to resource, and, and a service model approach to computing. So let's go back to the hype curve. We go to the peak of inflated expectations. Next thing we need to do is we need to figure out what are those expectations? So this is a pretty primitive way of representing it, but essentially do a gap analysis. So let's come back. We're trying to solve the right problem. Not just create a cloud for cloud sake, but follow the right problem. So what are the expectations today? Expectations is, are you can auto scale and load balance. It means you can grow and contract and you can move load around. And so going, That's, that sounds like great, I want that. I want to be able to build, hey, you know what, I'm going to add um, another group of uh, students to my system to register for classes. Great, but I'm going to need another computer. Could you just do that instead of taking downtime? Cloud would be great for that. I'm ready for that. Unfortunately, the issue with that is the application influences that. See, the application influences scalability and performance. So another, another example that's recently happened at Oracle. We have another large client doing a huge implementation, and uh, they essentially have a, in a figurative sense, a cloud in the back and they're running out of capacity, and so we can auto-scale it, no problem. We can auto-scale and load balance, just like they say. We can auto-scale, not load balance. I'll tell you why in a minute. So now we can make it bigger and they go faster. It's that simple, right? It's a cloud. and connect my application. The problem is the application is going at the same piece of data through all of the scaling, and it's all serialized through that data. This guy holds the data before this guy can do it. So what happens to the other Things that are trying to access the data, they wait. In essence, they wait faster, but they're still waiting. Right? They're still waiting, the customer's not getting anything back. So the expectation is, oh, well, just add more nodes, add more of this, more of that, more storage, more capacity, and get it through. But in the end, you wait faster. It's the biggest mistake most IT shops actually make is that they end up waiting faster. They tell us to go put more computers in and more storage and more network bandwidth and everything else, and they end up waiting faster. So the application, a lot of times, influences how you can scale. Where cloud works well 
is where the application understands it has a cloud in the back. But isn't the cloud supposed to hide the infrastructure from us? It just gives it to us when we need it. That's not, that's not precisely true. Uh, second thing, secure systems and robust data governance. That's the expectation. It's all secure. It's in a data center. A bunch of compute. You can't get in. Uh, hackers can't get into it. Everything. You would expect that, right? Well, there's a different level of hacking and different level of security. And guess what that does? That changes the cloud. So remember kind of the principle around the cloud. You're going to take something and you're going to move something or expand something, contract something. But what happens when you have to go uh, between customers? What happens if you have a system that's outside of a firewall and inside a firewall? It starts changing the whole complexity on the back end as soon as you bring in the security layers, particularly in the network layer. At Oracle On Demand, I can't tell you how many firewalls we have in between all systems. So I can't just take a middle tear from one customer and move it to another customer easily. All right, so the data governance thing, again, it's around an authorization framework. It doesn't come for free. There's lots of, compute, lots of things that need to do, be in the back to keep people from reading each other's data and protecting people around data privacy and other issues in that area. Third, uh, application infrastructure independence. I just gave that example. So the assumption is I write an application, I write it in Java or I, or, I, or I buy something, an application from Oracle, and I just connect and the whole thing's independent. It's not independent. There is no cloud API. So if you're going to use Amazon EC2, it's x86 based, and you're going to write an application in an x86 language. Right? It doesn't really have, it has some notion of an API developing, but it's Amazon's API. Guess what? You go to Google Apps, it's more Java based. You go to Microsoft Azure, which is their cloud, it's .NET based. These aren't cloud. It, it, you're, what do you, how different is that from writing on a Windows application or a Unix application? The cloud being ubiquitous and that you truly separated the infrastructure is not the case. The framework that you're working on is dictating what you're doing in the application. So the expectations are high, but the reality is something different. Um, this next one's more of a, a, a business uh, expectation, which is pay for only what you use. Let's think about it. What is what you use? What's capacity? If you go look at all the cloud providers, they all have different notions on what pay for use means. Those business models are completely different. So the expectation is, hey, if I use a little, I pay a little. If I use a little more, I pay a little more. If I use a little less, I pay a little less. Well, all those business models are changing and developing with every vendor and every definition and permutation you can speak of. So this is really, this is really nice. We certainly saw it. We've actually considered at different points looking at putting our backup storage somewhere else because we didn't want to have to buy it all up front and have a bunch of it unused. We'll just buy a little as we need it. Much more effect efficient from our standpoint. But then when you start working out all the business parts where how much it costs, it costs us a fortune. So this is, you know, it's only pay for what you need, but in the end, I don't know if that's an advantage all the time. And it's certainly not consistent in the way vendors are charging today. Economies of shared resources, a little bit more nuanced. Uh, some systems actually need to be isolated from other systems. So, you know, if they all shared the same storage in the cloud and two customers were on it and the storage goes down, you lose two customers. Well, sometimes customers don't like that. So they fail on their own. They don't want another customer failing. So that's not economy of shared resources. Still could be in a cloud, just be, un it'd just be a cloud not being used. So that's not necessarily meeting everything that they would expect. They have a bunch of existing applications. Can I talk to a cloud in the back? Can I just do it? You've got to migrate. More incurred cost. Cloud's changing everything, right? Yeah, it is. It's ending up costing me a lot of money if I keep going through this. And the infrastructure transparency. So there's also a requirements. I cannot go down. I've got to be up 7 by 24. If a machine goes down, I still need access. Well, that changes the way the cloud infrastructure is constructed in the back. So we have some very high expectations of what the cloud delivers. We have to really assess where we're at. The expectations actually are no different than what you would expect before the cloud. There's just a belief system that the cloud is going to make that better. And in some cases it will, in some cases it won't. 
So we have to baseline, we have to do a gap analysis to, turn, to determine what is the difference between the expectation and reality. Okay, so now, turning a little bit to the on-demand side. So we've talked about technology triggers, we've talked about expectation of reality on the peak curve. I'm still asked the question, go build a cloud. So what do I do? Now I truly do believe that the technology triggers are changing quite a few things in what we can do in the technology base. But I'm not caught up in the expectations. I'm back to being a businessman. In Oracle On Demand, this is a slide long before the cloud, although you can apply it to the cloud. If you look at what Oracle On Demand's, what they're supposed to provide the marketplace, accelerated time to value. Great, I can bring a system up instantaneously with the cloud. That's great. We were doing that before, but that's good. That gives me something to work with. I can provide more technology there. Reduce risk. I have standard components in the back. I can fix once, or I can find once and fix many. I can do lots of things to reduce the risk in terms of problems. Lower predictable costs, provided the business model fits with that, but pay for what you use. Scalability and choice. We talked about scalable architectures. This looks pretty good, right? So this is what the business does today. And so now I'm starting to think, okay, so now we're starting to get it. I understand there's technology enablers, right? I understand the expectations I'll never meet. I understand there's some stuff we're already doing that's almost there. Okay, now I'm starting to formulate a strategy. New name doesn't mean everything's new. Just because there's a cloud, and I kind of alluded to that in the last slide, doesn't mean that everything's new. Commodity building blocks, we've been building blocks for, I guess, eight years now. Virtualized computing resource, we've been using virtualization on storage for six years, seven years virtualization on the servers for three years. Okay, so these are the good, these are the existing blocks. All of a sudden cloud came up, it's not like I'm going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? We're doing lots of good things already that you would associate with the cloud. We're doing automated provisioning, it's not 100% automated. It's probably 70 to 80% automated. Reusable infrastructure across applications. Remember I talked about how the application and it needed to have independence with the infrastructure, that's one of the attributes of a cloud. Well, we've already been doing that. We've had to do that. We didn't have a cloud to manage it. We didn't have the notion of a cloud, but we had an application. We had a bunch of infrastructure, and we need to migrate and use it across different infrastructures. Uh, the other one's a little more nuanced. Standard application images. Well, if I'm going to put it into a cloud, I want to manage it the same way, so I want it to look the same way, and I want to change it the same way, so we've been doing that. Centralized systems and lifecycle. Remember my service model? Yeah, we've, we've been doing that. We have lots of tools and lots of workflow systems that do that. In fact, the upgrade factory here at the end, that was already a cloud. Basically what that was, that was a set of machines on the side. So when somebody wanted to upgrade their application, they would just go to this other thing. We would allocate it. Probably not as pretty as a cloud you would like, but we would allocate it and they would upgrade their system and then we'd move it back, we'd release it, and the next customer would come in. A lot better than if you had your own IT shop and you all had to buy your own upgrade grid, we reuse it. So we have a lot of things going on. In fact, the picture on the other side is our current picture. It's just recasting what we've been doing at least the last four to five years. So everyone wants to jump on the cloud. Let's go do the cloud. And the reality is we have been doing the cloud. There are just some pieces here that we need to close the door to help complete the picture from the technology enabler to business value. So, we're there. We have triggers. We have gap analysis. We have what the business is. We have existing capabilities. Finally, it's not about going and building a cloud. It's about building a fully automated on-demand provisioning uh, framework. I've now reduced it into an engineering activity. After all that, after my, my CIO number two, now I'm starting to reduce it into an actual activity that will provide value that uses the technology triggers. Basically all this is doing is what I explained. We already have 70 to 80% of this automated. Just finish it. Because the other things we can do once we do this, which is the next technology opportunities, we can really start doing cloud-like activities on the infrastructure in the back. Right? We might have a separate system today for customer requirements and it doesn't automatically feed the provisioning in, uh, engine and it's not quite cooked up with the images. That's just a simple matter of engineering. 
Finally, I've got something I can deliver. So finally, I can tell my team, let's go do something. I said, tell them, go build a cloud, and they all scratch their head, and they say, what the hell are you talking about? So this is the first one. Just a simple provisioning. Provision instance, go to the cloud, give me compute, give me network, give me storage, put an image on it, give somebody uh, an address, start it up. Make it all automatic using commodity building blocks, virtualization, all the things we've already done. Second technology opportunity, automated capacity management. So one of the real, one of the expectations from customers that is consistent is that they have some notion of expansion of capacity. They also have a notion of contraction, but I think there's a stronger desire to expand because applications tend to grow and they need more capacity. Again, rapid provisioning, it's just another version of pr provisioning. Right? I got to provision more, not provision the initial. But I need to figure out what is that capacity to provision. And since I run the systems, I can monitor them and I say, you know what, you're running flat out all the time. I can put it through some simple algorithms, spit it into a provisioning engine and use the virtualized access, remember the technology enablers, and bring a system up. Now I'm getting into engineering. Now it's starting to get fun for me because it's no longer some esoteric notion that could be anything. We're getting into actual engineers, uh, engineering here in order to deliver value to the business. Final one, right now the way Oracle On Demand works is you log a request. The request gets provisioned to a delivery team in the back and they do all the magic in the back. Well, the, version, uh, the cloud expectation is a customer gets to do some of that themselves. I want to make a request for more capacity. So we already have a user interface. Let's go enhance the user interface and start exposing what's happening on the delivery engine to the front. So now I've got three things. I could tell my team I've got three things. I'm actually solving a problem, a technology problem. I'm improving the process and what we're doing. I'm automating the process. I'm improving the service levels. I'm initiating action much more quickly with the customer and recognize revenue faster, good business stuff. Probably create more creative business models so they don't have to pay for everything up front because they don't have to pay for all the computers because we basically just allocate as you go. There's so all kinds of opportunity being generated. We finally have taken it from this abstract notion all the way down into some actionable items that provide real business value. It's got to impact this, and I'm not going to go through this, but this is basically Oracle On Demand. For me, anyways, it has to impact this. This is Oracle On Demand service portfolio. So basically, we manage Oracle software sitting on infrastructure, and this is what it is today. You can see there's quite a bit of services we got to provide here. So what did I do? I've come down to three technology opportunities using key enablers. Whoops. Just looking at them. These three enablers are impacting significantly a majority of the portfolio. Now I'm solving a problem. If you take, for example, let's choose one, testing services. So basically, people implement applications, they need to test them. Do they need to buy all the hardware up front to do that? Because after they're done testing, do they really need the hardware? Some do, some don't. Do they need as much hardware? If they're doing scaling testing, they certainly probably don't because they don't do that all the time. So take it offline. I only pay for it when I need it. Take it offline. Great. Can I do that now? Yes. Right? Let's choose another one. How about uh, disaster recovery? Well, disaster recovery is putting up another instance, and I'm going to oversimplify this, in another data center. Well, if I can provision it, replicate it, grow, contract it, all those baseline capabilities could now enhance my disaster recovery service, operate at lower cost, be more predictable. Uh, uh, problem management, that's a good one. I can create a crash, okay, uh, my, my system's crashing. I need to replicate it. Do I have to go buy another computer to go replicate it? See, this is what's happening with the cloud thinking because it is a great opportunity because I don't need that. I just need a crash and burn system for a little while. Bring it up, provision it, bring up an exact replica, replicate it, test it, fix it, patch it, then when you're done, patch of production, tear it down, doesn't cost me anything. These are all things that are made possible by just doing some simple things underneath versus creating this abstract notion of a cloud. What else? Now, I think there's a number of interesting ones here, but uh, 
I think those are some good examples. So in the end, we have to make an impact on this. The thing I don't have in this slide is the other 10 or 15 services I just enabled. So it's not just, let's just make the ones we have better. Let's go create ones we never really even thought about. How about a performance management service? Right? I want to tune something offline versus online with a bunch of tooling around it because my service model's there. I have a testing service, I have testing in part of my service model, it's embedded in change management, and then I can run those tests offline before I promote a change. <coughs> we can start coming up with a whole new set of uh, services in Oracle On Demand. And this is just Oracle On Demand. Uh, there's a whole bunch of opportunity here for every business. That's why you're seeing people rush to it. The other observation I have though, in the rush to do it, they forgot what they actually were, one. Two is, they're rushing to something that's a little bit more esoteric or basically a replication of what they're already doing, recast with a new name. Reality is there are some key technology um, changes taking place underneath. I've identified three. I could probably give you 10 or 15 more, but we got an hour, so I just gave you three of mine. But there's other little things that are enabling this. This is why there's momentum, right? We believe it's a huge opportunity in, in Oracle. Uh, we also have an on-demand appl or a cloud appliance that's been announced. We believe there's opportunity all over the place in terms of bringing some core engineering capabilities based on some technology enablers to the cloud. That's why you're hearing the excitement. It's not about just building some esoteric cloud. Try to leave a couple minutes here for questions. So I just, on this, I'll close some closing thoughts. Not around cloud, but something I would like to, to leave with you is one is technology innovation is generally overhyped. When you hear it's the next thing, start asking yourself, is it really the next thing? When I heard cloud, I had actually another slide in here, but I, I took it out because Larry's kind of changed. But Larry was all over the cloud, Larry Ellison of Oracle. He said, this is ridiculous. This makes no sense. The cloud is everything. He had some great quotes. And Larry's always good for a quote. Right, he just, he thought this was the most ridiculous thing. In fact, probably caught Larry aside, there'd probably be parts of it he'd still say that. Because now what's happened is that he's got to catch up to it because if he just continues to fight all the momentum, that's not going to be productive for Oracle. So now we're trying to catch it, but we're trying to frame it correctly. These things are overhyped. Larry knew that, that's why he initially came out that way. And now what Larry's producing, if you, anybody paid attention to the news around Oracle last month, we're starting to produce things that actually provide real value in the cloud. So one, it's overhyped. It's driven by some sort of business or technology trigger. In the case of the cloud, it's pay for use, different business model or technology triggers like virtualized access, commodity infrastructure. And the second bullet I can't emphasize enough, beware of solving the wrong problem well. Too often engineers are going out to fix something that doesn't need to be fixed or, or engineering a problem that's really not a problem. Understand the expectations in reality, right? Systematically break down what's going on so that you can get to those three pieces and eventually it all needs to contribute to some business value. There's some differentiated value. You know, what's different about what you're doing, lower operating costs, higher levels of service, or new product or service opportunities. So with that, that's my prayer. Yes. So the, the comment was I'd share some of the, my role in education. Um, my other hat that I've worn at Oracle is that uh, uh, I've, Oracle has a series of training programs, particularly around leadership, and uh, I'm very passionate about that and that um, it's actually related a lot to what we just talked about. Um, what's happening, I see a lot, is that uh, the globe is producing some, some fabulous engineers. And uh, two things are happening. One is we're solving the wrong problem well. So we can't really optimize the assets we're creating. And two is the imagination and creativity that's required to think about these problems in slightly orthogonal ways to produce some sort of differentiated value requires more than just engineering skill. It, it requires imagination. Um, you know, I don't, I, you know, education helps set a baseline for me but what's helped me get to where I was, to where 
I am, for better or for worse, um, was that uh, I believe I had an imagination and, uh, and a drive to go after something. And so what I've done at Oracle is uh, I've created some pretty innovative, or at least I consider them, I guess that's self-serving, but <laughs> so be it, uh, s some uh, leadership programs which have become a, base, a benchmark at Oracle. Executing them across the company has been a bit challenging, but essentially taking uh, engineers in and it's a leadership training where we take some of the core principles around what is a leader and what are the attributes of a leader and tying it back into core deliverables for the company. So the unique approach I took was is that I tied all the business objectives directly to the, to the education. So at the end of it, so for example, just to make it more concrete, um, I set the teams of these leaders off and I said, okay, here's my three biggest business problems. Go solve them. And they're not easy, and I don't give them a lot of tools to do it. And there's nobody telling them what to do. They're my biggest. Go solve them. And then we set up a really compressed environment so that it's kind of a, kind of a bubble, if you will, that creates an incredible amount of pressure and tension, which forces people to work in a different way. And I can tell you no matter what, whether I create it in a training course or whether you do it in business, that's the way it's going to work. Anybody who's worked with Larry Ellison knows that, and I certainly do. Uh, the pressure, the ability to think out of the box, the imagination has to come because you can't solve it in a systematic way. I have a new engineer that joined. We just recently acquired Sun. And I asked him, how long does it take? And he wants to work every algorithm out. You know what? By the time he's done working that out, They've reassigned it or gotten rid of his role altogether because it just missed the entire opportunity. He cannot figure it out in a systematic way. Trying to teach people to think differently about how to do that is not an easy thing, and I've created this kind of structure, and I think it's absolutely critical to my success um, of my team is that if I can get that and scale what I consider my strengths through them by giving them a very uh, concentrated leadership training and and try to teach how to think orthogonally. There's nobody better. I've worked with Larry Ellison. I've worked with Steve Jobs. I used to be the Apple guy at Oracle. And those are two obviously very creative thinkers. And the one attribute, I remember the first time I went in there and I, you know, I thought, man, I really know how to do this. I could think out of the box. I've heard about it. I go up to the boardroom and Larry's got me spinning every which way. I, I just couldn't believe how his imagination and creativity work. And it wasn't groundless. It was absolutely grounded in the pragmatic reality of what was going on. But I realized that he is, look, he is not looking straight. He's looking at a lot of different angles. And so I was wondering, so I would learned painfully sometimes in the boardroom how to do that, and I've created some education programs to try to get varying levels of that into different people. I think one of the th things that I, uh, I would encourage you all to do is don't lose the imagination and creativity and understand that some ways of thinking there's the basics to engineer, modular, reusable, et cetera, that you would learn in, in engineering. But the thing that separates somebody doing something from somebody who's leading something is this kind of orthogonal thinking. And I'm, I'm just convinced of it because all the leaders that I've fashioned my career and role models that I've had all have the ability to do that. So, uh, yeah, I'm very passionate about it. That's my other job. Actually, it might be this job after this. It might be the job I take after this job because I really do believe in this. That's why I'm here, and, uh, and uh, we'll see how far we, the next step goes with that. Thank you. All right.